Cars of the 50s and 60s. This is a book about that era that I'm calling the classic era. Some of you may call it the post-war period in history. It's surely going to be forever known as the golden age, at least where it relates to automobiles. This isn't an encyclopedia with entries like some of the other large books I've reviewed, but it is about the whole world during those two decades, and the author talks about the typical very well-known classics, some unusual sports cars, delightful microcars, and everyday transportation from every corner of the world, as you'll see. The book is a large format, great for these amazing line art drawings throughout. It's organized into six chapters that tell the story of the era in narrative style, lavishly illustrated with color pictures of the cars of the era in as-used condition, not these unrealistically shiny, waxed, polished Concours d'Elegance. These are real cars, loved by their owners and driven daily by the looks of many of them, like the Citroen Traction up there, or they're just an older car parked out back like this Renault Frigate. Oh, take a look at this car in the top left. It's an Aero Miner. Remember we saw one of these in my encyclopedia of the motor car video. Here they have the bonnet open, showing the amazing little two-cylinder water-cooled two-stroke engine with the radiator behind the engine DKW style. The caption talks about the DKW links to this car. Lovely. The second chapter explains the development of engines and transmissions of the era. In Europe, this was the time of electronic pre-selection, free wheel, and in the USA, the appearance of automatics. And it's accompanied by amazing works of art like this rendering of the front-wheel drive Peugeot 204 and its engine, axle, and suspension layout. I love how Peugeot's Lion emblem is there without the name of the company. The emblem and the technical layout of the car says it all. Now that's great branding. Here's some more beautiful photos of classics still in use on the road. An Austin Mini, MG 1100, Hillman Imp, and Simcoe 1000. I like how the arrangement of the pictures also serves as a commentary on the car's configurations. Front engine, front wheel drive on the left, rear engine, rear wheel drive on the right. More gorgeous line art, a see-through of the Renault Dauphine on the right, it's even shown in plan view. I actually remember opening to this picture in the bookstore and it immediately sold me on the book. The NSU Prins, clearly a daily driver too, with no hubcaps and the engine popped open for some reason. I've mentioned the Jawat Javelin a few times before. The line art shows it in the center with removable front grille, and on the right is a see-through of the 250cc air-cooled two-stroke twin in the Glas Gagomobile. No story about this era would be complete without Borgward. Here are two 1960 Borgward Isabellas with surprisingly modern-looking slotted wheels but with only two doors. The caption laments the lack of a four-door and the antiquated engine. I couldn't leave out this line art with a diagram of another development from the era, the Wenkel engine with its trianguloid rotors. I've seen plenty of diagrams of the engine, but I think these are the best, as used in the Mazda Cosmo. Sometimes the background of a picture sets the scene, like with the BMW 507 photo. The Spanish Pegaso sports car is parked in front of some appropriately classical architecture, and the Heinkel bubble car with the front open. The third chapter is about some of the exotic cars of the era, like Daimler limousines and Ferraris, as shown here. Here I think the Packard is considered a beautiful car by the author, while the small Hudson Jet Compact is described as measures of desperation, and the Fiat 1100 is panned for its ugly duckling looks, but I have to say this is the first time I've seen Italian design referred to as anything other than beautiful. Here is another two-page cutaway and layout drawing similar to the one of the Peugeot. The emblem says it all because the car needs no introduction. The Beetle with its rear-engine platform. I have to say the side cutaway makes it look much more practical than it actually is, but hey, it's probably the most famous car of the century. More great line art. Unorthodox engine openings, the tip-forward Triumph, tip-backward Panardina. On the next page is a Lancia in winter. I totally ignored a Lancia on a previous page. That's because really, sometimes background is everything. Have you a tiger in your tank? Car advertising in the 50s and 60s. I have to admit, some boring cars here. That Ford on the left is dull as dishwater. I like the red-on-red -red photography on the right, and how it says so. I would have skipped this page because the low-quality black and white but it's DeSoto, and we love DeSotos on this channel, so Virgil Exner's styling is some of the best out of America in the 50s. 
Here we have the Lanchester 10. The guy sitting in the chair with the cigar is hilarious. And on the right you have the Wolseley 690, another Wolseley. And here we have some color coordination. Yes, it's important. The Ford Falcon's colors matches the livery of the Pan Am airliner and the green Saab driving through the greenery. Now, a lot of people from other countries may have always criticized Americans for not having economy cars in the 1950s. This advertisement for the Willys Arrow up in the top left pretty much proves them wrong. Look, you can see there they're advertising 35 miles per gallon for a small American car from the early 1950s, no less. Then you have kind of a nuts and bolts newspaper advertisement for the Wartburg for the UK market. And of course, we can't forget that the Mini has won the Monte Carlo rally three times in the 1960s. And it's ironic because the Mini was originally marketed as an economy car. And here it is being advertised quite rightly as a driver's car. This is showing Volkswagen's hugely successful heavy black font on white background advertising. Then we have some local advertising for the home market in Egypt. This car is the Ramses. What, you couldn't tell? It's actually a modified NSU Prinz built under license. There's another illustration of the pickup truck version here in the book. Looking all ready for the desert. And the caption of the book mocks the ad for using a painting, even though tons of ads back then used paintings, including American cars. It's what the picture is about that's far more important. The artist clearly wasn't hired for his car drawing skills. I could draw a better car than that when I was six. But it's aspirational. The modern family wearing modern clothes going on a road trip in their new car. The picture is offering that possibility. And it's not an import. It's our own car for the modern Egyptian family. Very cool. Some specialist British sports cars. The Marcos on the left and TVR on the right. I'm not sure how they go along with the Amphicar, but there you are. And finally on to the microcars. The Messerschmitt Tiger bubble car parked in a field during sunset. A bunch of Berkeleys. It's a cute but weird looking micro sports car. And below it the Bond mini car van on grass and the Lloyd Alexander appropriately in the garden. Some amazing line art of microcars. The BMW 600 is actually really amazing and even more ingenious of a package than the Fiat 600. The oddball Rayana is up there with its fold-out front axle with some line art of the Vespa car. They made a little car in about 1958-61 to 61 time frame. On this page, I couldn't care less about the Ferrari. I was more interested in the Dyna Panard from 1965. Below it is the Skoda 1000 MB. It doesn't say if these people are Czech citizens or if it's an import to the UK. I'm guessing UK because of the reflections in the window. Small cars from two Germanys. The Opel Cadet. It's Oliver, made famous by Richard Hammond in Top Gear way back in about 2007 when he found one in Africa. The DKW Junior is on the bottom left, looking to be a daily driver like many of the cars in this book. The wonderful Gagomobile Coupe and of course the Trabant from around 1970 or so, the end of this era in the book. So that's Cars of the 50s and 60s, a pretty nice book you should definitely check out and you can learn a lot from it. It's an important era and there are other books in the series too, the 30s, 40s, and 70s and 80s, those maybe I'll check out uh, in another video. Some of the cars on my shelf are out of this book and that's what I'll be showing in the next part. So see you there.